Come back here and stand by the back side of the car. You're gonna be detained right now, okay? Do you have anything illegal in the car? Okay. What the f The majority of stops the cops make are simple and routine, but sometimes a simple stop can lead to some of the most shocking discoveries ever made. Jesus. Four kilos? Nope. From busting $500,000 worth of illegal substances to discovering a missing body in a car, here are four of the craziest unexpected police busts of all time, starting with a stop that ended up saving multiple lives. It's a fucking bomb in the back of that car. On January 24th, 2022, a Walmart employee notified cops that a woman had stolen $300 worth of Legos from their store. Initially, there was nothing out of the ordinary about this, just a regular shop lifting call. And that's how the cops approached it when they spotted her vehicle and pulled it over. But just minutes later, the cops would discover something that would turn things from simple to one of the most strange and terrifying stops we've ever covered. Hey, I'm Officer Johnson. Hi. Hey, do you get your license and insurance on you? So the reason we stopped you is today because Walmart called and they're, did you suspect of possibly ringing up some items? I you buy items? Yeah. Okay. Again, things started out quite simple. Obviously, she denies the allegations of stealing, so the cops check her ID and decide how they want to approach the situation. But when the second cop comes back to ask her some questions, that's when things get crazy. So, what were you doing at Walmart? Is that yeah. Buying stuff? Okay. Because we're going to call it, you stole all Legos earlier. As he's talking with the girl who identified as 20-year-old Mariah, he noticed the stolen Legos in the back seat next to something that was much more concerning. Will you roll down your back window for me? Thank you. What is all that? All right, go ahead and hop out real quick. You're going to be detained right now, okay? Bro. Yeah, go ahead and secure her. There's a fucking bomb in the back of that car. Like, a bunch of fireworks strapped together with like metal and shit and wrapped around. Oh. It, it, explain to me what that device is in the back of your car that looks like a bomb. Uh, I didn't, my boyfriend made that. Okay, sit tight. As the cop said, he spotted what appeared to be an explosive device in the back seat of the car, right next to the stolen Legos. Things just went from zero to 100 instantly, especially as the girl says she's been arrested multiple times before and that her boyfriend is allegedly involved in this as well. And things only become more concerning when they look more closely at the device and see exactly how it's constructed. Can you start a supervisor out here? It looks like there's some sort of explosive device in the back of the car that someone has built. It's got like four big ass fireworks, big old screws and shit all within that. And then it's wrapped, got like a bunch of stuff wrapped around it. It's definitely made to cause some damage when it goes off. Yeah. Even though the cops are fairly certain it's not set to explode remotely, they still have to take every precaution to protect the public, and so shut off the roads around the vehicle as quickly as possible. Then it's on to the next most important task, finding out exactly who made it and what they were planning to do with it. She just, all she said is that uh, her boyfriend made it. Um, so we probably want to figure out who boyfriend is and uh, if there's any more in his house, maybe. So what, what's the deal in the back of your car? You said your boyfriend built it? Mm -hmm. I honestly have no, I don't know nothing about fireworks except uh -huh. for fireworks. I mean, okay, what's your boyfriend's name? Zane. What? Zane? Yeah. Okay, when did he make that? Or? I don't, yes, a couple days ago. Okay, do you know why he made it or anything? She was then asked to call her boyfriend, who arrived on foot soon later. If you think things are strange already, just wait until you see how he behaves. What's up, bud? What's your name? Zane Bennett. Okay, Zane, come over here and hang out for a second. Do you have any ID on you? Uh, my girlfriend had it on her. Okay. 
Notice that the very first thing Zane asks is if he can get his car back. He wasn't told why he had to come to the scene, but it's obvious he's aware of exactly what's in that back seat and is desperate to figure out a way out of this. Where'd you come from? My friend had brought it up here. So you're not on an arrest boat, but I'm gonna detain you real quick because we got some things we gotta talk about. So man, I'll, I'll just I'll just cut to the chase and I'll tell you why we have like all this shut down and everything. Right. Is is it, it has to do with the little device you've made? It looks like some fireworks tied together, some nolts and buds to it. So so that's why we have this all shut down because it's kind of our protocol is is it it looks right. like an explosive device. Right. Yeah, you know, it's a, no. do you is it like active? Is it like volatile no. to where if it falls it's, breaks? No, is it gonna it, go off? It, it's, it's literally just fireworks. Like like if you take it apart, it's one bunch of little fireworks. With Zane in the back seat being questioned, tensions were high as they tried to figure out exactly what he was going to do with the weapon. But strangely, the only person who didn't seem nervous was Zane himself, and the reason why is even more perplexing than anything else in the whole case. So yeah, he he said he's just out doing, he was going to do some redneck stuff today, and he was going to take it out and blow up some watermelons with it. He said it's a couple of fireworks tied together, you have to light it like a normal firework, and he said I just wanted to see what the stuff I taped to it on the outside would do if I lit it by a watermelon. All the screws and everything. Yeah, I said, I said, were you trying to use it as a weapon, were you going to, you know, go do anything today? He goes, no, I was just going to blow up some watermelons. And I said, okay. I was like, alright, cool. So. He doesn't even seem really ner nervous at all about it. As insane as Zane's story sounded, it turned out to be true. And a few hours later, the bomb squad determined the device to be safe, constructed out of fish hooks, bolts, and fireworks. Nevertheless, Zane was charged with illegally manufacturing an explosive device and Mariah with petty larceny for stealing the Legos. But not every case like this has such a happy ending. Just like the cops found out when they made the biggest bust of their careers, while on a completely routine traffic stop. A criminal, I'm not a crook. I was not going to get we in my car. We I swear to you. But as the cops would find out, this man was much more than a criminal. He'd been hiding a deadly secret for almost 28 years. On the 16th of August, 2022, officers from the Oconee County Sheriff's Office were conducting random registrations on random vehicles when a Mazda flagged up as having no insurance and a suspended license. The driver identified himself as Rise Sekim and immediately seemed not just anxious, but terrified. What's your, what's your last name? It's the Kim. It's the Kim. Okay. All right, I'm going to have you go and step out the vehicle for me. This All right, out. so here, here's what's going to happen, Mr. Kim, okay? Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to place you into custody today, okay? You're going to go down to jail. Oh, no. you got to get booked in. I'm going to take your fingerprints and picture, and you'll get a bond. But because you're driving on a suspended license, you've got to go down to jail. So I did not know. I have children. I have a sick uncle, and I run the household. I guess. Unfortunately, no, I really don't. don't have a choice at this well, time. Please so we'll place me under arrest. Go ahead and turn around. Put your hands on your back, please. Please put your hands on your back. Put your back. Sekim was all but ready to leave before the deputies notified him that he was being detained for having no valid insurance, something that seemed to immediately set him off. From this point on, watch how Sekim acts around the cops. It's understandable to be nervous and uncomfortable in this situation, but something about the extent of Sekim's anxiety seems odd to the cops. Who set the phone up on the car? They put me under arrest right now. They, I don't know. For driving with suspended license? Driving with suspended license. I didn't know. And, 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 it's, and it's not even showing. Unfortunately, the law is different here in Georgia than it is in South Carolina. If you have a suspended license, you have to go down to the jail and get booked in. Okay, but, but sir, can you speak to my aunt? She has to, we're, we're on speakerphone. She can okay, hear us right now. No, please speak to her. Please, please speak to her. I'm the only one that can help with my uncle that's sick in ICU right now. Sorry about that. Please, sir. Please, sir. Yes, sir. We're going to walk you to my partner's oh, car. Come on. Sir, come on. Please, my aunt is old. She's 80 years old. Oh, sir, please. Do you have anything I, on I will not. I swear, you can, please check me. Okay. Please check uh, everything on me. I'm going to search you and send you to arrest. Huh? See what says emergency 911? Yes. Face towards that. Okay. Separate your feet out. Okay, Nothing in your pockets, right? Sir, please. What please. all do you need out of your pocket? Sir, I have a child at the house that they cannot take care of. I what have... all do you need out of your car? Sir, 
The only crime Sekum has committed is driving without the valid insurance and license necessary. This is not a major crime by any means, and could be punishable solely by a small fine and a short ban from driving. It's not the end of the world for Sekum, and the cops are trying to communicate that to him. But nothing seems to calm him down and the officers start to get suspicious. Sir, I do for my entire family. Okay. Well, do you know, I'm, I don't have a choice here, man. I'm telling you. That, I, I told you job. I was not going to get in my car. We I don't swear have to a you, choice. I wasn't going to get in you my car. You have a suspended car. license. You're driving a car without insurance. You've got that taken care of. I've been of. doing it every you day. you got suspended registration. My you have to, to go down to the jail and get booked in. Just take your photograph. They're going to take your fingerprints. They'll give you a bond amount. And you can bond out, and then you can get on the way up to the hospital. But you can't drive. Sir, I... I so have a seat. Okay. Okay, please. Okay, may I speak after you? Have a seat. Are you going to sit sing? down and then I'll listen to you. Okay, so what do you what do you want to tell me? On, on everything, my aunt just had a stroke. My uncle just had a stroke two and a half weeks ago. Yeah. I'm here helping my family. Really I don't even know who that. can come and bond me out. I don't even know who can come and bond me out. I'm not a criminal. I'm not a crook. I'm if you. I look how I mean, old you, I am. Did you get a ticket or something? I didn't did get they it. Care? I, I don't. Mean, why would they suspend your license in South Carolina? Sekum just isn't listening and only gets more anxious. He's continuously pleading with the cops and attempting to seem like a respectable family man. But one major thing stands out in this piece of footage. In his attempts to seem trustworthy, he's been pretty consistently maintaining eye contact with the officers. But take a look at what he's saying during the first moment he breaks eye contact for a significant amount of time. I'm not a criminal. I'm not a crook. I'm if you. I look how old I am. That break in eye contact implies heavily that what he's saying isn't the truth, and he subconsciously wants to look away in this moment because the bond of trust is broken. Obviously, in the grand scheme of things, this could never be used to convict someone, or even be used as probable cause to search. But it is a pretty brazen sign of what the cops will soon discover. Yeah. I just found out that maybe when we had a car that I had that got repossessed, that yeah. I didn't take my name off of it. Okay. Um, now, I wouldn't imagine that they'd suspend you for a repossession. But that's what I'm saying. I did. I don't. But but it's no no information is coming up. I won't drive. I will, I'll have my cousin. Can you slide your license in for us? You're not going to speak to me? No, unfortunately. You're, I told you. I've already explained my position. To you. Oh, this hurts. I don't have a choice. Uh, oh. Look, you can get in and get out, all right? I can get in and get out? Yeah, like, they'll book you in. If you have somebody that can bond you out, you have a preset bond, so you can bond out of jail. You don't have to wait to see a judge. Well, how much is that? Uh, I'm not quite sure. They'll give it to you when we get there, okay? We'll work with you, all right? We'll try to get you out as quick as possible. Yeah. The cops are being extremely nice to Sekim, trying to put his mind at ease by repeating that it isn't a huge deal and that he'll be out by the end of the day. But that wasn't the case at all. Sekim was taken back to the police station and processed, but when he was asked to scan his fingerprints, a match was found. And the name wasn't the one he'd given. Instead, it was Muhammad El Amin, and there was a reason he was on file. 28 years ago, in 1994, Muhammad allegedly shot and killed a man with a handgun at a train station before fleeing and seemingly disappearing entirely. It took a simple suspended license for the three-decade-long manhunt to come to an end, and Muhammad is currently awaiting trial. He will almost certainly be facing the full charges for his crimes, as violent crimes, especially those resulting in death, are exempt from the statute of limitations. But even that didn't shock the police as much as this next bust did. When cops discovered almost a million dollars worth of narcotics given away by a simple tinted window. These cops noticed a red SUV driving on the highway in Florida with windows that seemed too dark to be legal. So they pulled it over with no idea exactly what they were about to uncover. Driver, can you roll down your back window, please? Thank you. Is this your car? Okay. Any issues with your driver's license today? Well, yeah, other than being lost, um, suspended or anything else like that. Okay. The woman identified herself as 27-year-old Elizabeth, and she said she was on her way back from a trip to Texas where she had lost her license. Everything seemed mostly fine, though. Her insurance was in check, and she had the rest of her documents with her, so things should have ended at the window tint check. 
Yes, the reason why I'm stopping you is your side window tint, which which I'll check here in just a minute. Is that something that you had done or something you bought the vehicle with? Yeah, unfortunately, even though you may purchase a vehicle with a window tint already on it, as the owner and the operator, you are responsible for whatever equipment is on the vehicle. Same, same concept as if you buy a car with a bad headlight or tail light or brake light or crack windshield or ball tires or something like that. I'm going to measure them here in just a minute with, with my 10 meter. Can you raise up your back window about halfway? I don't know if you can see that or not. Probably not, but your back window is coming in at 2% light transmitting. In Florida, the lowest you can have a window tint on the rear windows is 15%, and Elizabeth's are coming at 2%, meaning that barely any light can pass through from the outside. So she was asked to step out of her vehicle so the cop could take her information and write her a ticket. This is when a second officer arrived on the scene with a canine for a quick free air sniff around the car. This too is fairly routine and more of a formality than anything in this case. They certainly weren't expecting the dog to alert, suggesting that there were drugs inside the car. Hey, uh, Ms. Espinosa, any reason that came out your vehicle? Okay. All right. Well, train police canine is alerted to your vehicle, so um, we're going to need to check it just to make sure there's nothing in there that okay. shouldn't be. Okay. okay. Um, you're not under arrest, okay. but you are going to be detained. Detained means that you're not free to go right now. Okay. Can I just have a seat for you, please? It's just okay. because... Am I able to make that call or? Ma'am? Am I able to make that call real yes, quick? Yes, go ahead. Okay. You can use your phone. <laughs> Remarkably, Elizabeth has remained calm throughout this entire ordeal, taking the tint charge on the chin and accepting her mistake. It's only when she picks up the phone when her demeanor starts to change. Take a listen to what she says next. Hey, can you let Maria know to go for my kids? Um, I just got pulled over. I came. I'm in the bush now, and um, I need. I need to pick up my kids. Estoy detenida. Yeah. No, tienen un perro. I don't know. Me, me dijeron que because of the tent, they said the tents were too dark and. There's another one here in the K9 Olio Algo, so I don't I don't know. Elizabeth also said on the phone in Spanish that the cops were about to find everything and that she wasn't getting out of this one. And she was right. But what exactly was she hiding? It turns out she was transporting 26 pounds or almost 12 kilograms of cocaine in her car, worth anything from 800,000 to 1.5 million dollars. Elizabeth's demeanor is almost creepy. On the phone, she bluntly states how they're going to find everything, but to the cops, she's calm, collected, and compliant, even when she finds out it's all over. Um, hey, this is what's going on. There are some items in the vehicle that we need to take a little bit closer look at. Okay. And uh, we need to inspect the vehicle a little bit further. Okay. But um, we need to put the vehicle up on a lift in order to do that. So there's a wrecker headed over this way. Uh, okay. And there's uh, his business is just right up here at the next exit just north of us. Okay. After the vehicle was fully searched and all the cocaine recovered, she was prosecuted and sentenced to 24 months in prison, followed by 36 months supervised release. But given the amount of product she lost, she's got a lot more to worry about than just the cops. But even this isn't the most insane thing that police can come across in traffic stops. So many criminals seem to forget about smaller crimes while they're on a big job. And that's exactly the mistake this man made that led him to a murder charge. On July 29, 2020, a Louisiana cop pulled over a vehicle speeding on the highway. It started just the same as any other traffic stop, but a search of the vehicle uncovered something horrifying. Sarge is a dead body in the trunk. Not only was Mitchell going almost 20 miles an hour over the speed limit, but he didn't even have a driver's license. Uh, do you have your driver's license? No, sir. Do you have a driver's license? No, sir. This charge alone could net him fines of up to $500 in six months in jail, not to mention the fines from the speeding ticket. But unbeknownst to the cop, Mitchell will be going back with more than just a speeding ticket. Is there any weed in the car, man? Let's don't stop. Step, step here. Is there any weed in the car? 
Yes or no? Just a doobie and an ashtray light. Okay. Other than that, there's anything light. else? There's a... When's it, when did you puff last? This was Be like... honest. Because I'm a drug recognition expert. About an hour ago. The cop is looking to get Mitchell on more than just a DUI charge. An 18 year old speeding in a car like this that stinks of weed tells the cop that there may be something deeper to this traffic stop than a kid going too fast. But before he asks to search the vehicle for any other drugs, Mitchell starts to act increasingly suspicious. All right, where are you headed right now? I was headed to, I was just headed back home. Where's home? What's your address? No, stop, stop, come here. Where do you live? It's easy. It's easy to answer this. Where do you live? Do you, you don't know how to drive to your house? I was coming from there, how I got lost. So what's the address? You don't know your address? No, sir. Okay, come back here. Can I take a look at your car? It's yes or no? Yes, sir. Mitchell has now consented to the search of his vehicle. The cop is realistically only searching for weed and any other drugs possibly in the car, but he has no idea what he's actually about to find. A search of the front seats turn up nothing, but upon examining the outside of the car, the cop discovered multiple bullet holes across the left side of the vehicle. It's becoming more and more obvious to the cop that something is not right at all here. And this suspect was likely caught up in something much bigger than he first realized. When did all this happen? When did all that happen? That happened. When? My brother, he said it How long ago? Like... Days? Yeah, like... Days? Okay, come back. Just leave this here. Come back here. Just stay right here in front of my car. Hey, it's Jesse again. I'm sorry to bother you. I got this car speeding 73 and 55. It's a black and orange Camaro. Yeah. And it's got like three bullet holes in the left side of it. He said he thinks his brother said that his car was in something two nights ago. The officer's check of the vehicle returns nothing other than proof Mitchell is lying. His address comes back as somewhere completely different to where he's saying, and the car is registered to someone with a completely different surname. Now he says he lives in Winsboro, but he's got a Richwood address, and the car comes back out of Monroe, and he's got this, uh, he's got a GPS thing put in, but he don't even know the address, so he's lying about a bunch of junk. Where do you live? Be honest to me. Monroe? Yes, Richwood? Yes, you don't live in Winsboro? Why would you try to bluff me on that? Why would you lie to me on that? Because I already knew that before this guy said something. What's up? Talk to me. You better stop lying to me right now or you're going to be in jail. I'm just going, I'm just going to my sister's To your sister's? That's the last freaking lie you better tell me. This whole situation is already immensely confusing. But then all of a sudden, something even weirder happens. A completely random man pulls up at the scene claiming that his family are looking for him. His family in Monroe is looking for him. Uh, they me out here. Okay, all right. Well, I got somebody pulling up behind me, Scooter. What do you mean they were looking for him? They looking for him. The car missing. Hey! Okay, give me your phone. Hey, man. He's not given that name, though. He's, he's, he's given another name. And when they give yet another different name for Mitchell and the owner of the vehicle, the cop rightfully is at a loss. This has gone from a traffic stop to a full-on mystery, and the cop is determined to get to the bottom of it. There's a kid that's been reported missing, and that they took the car from Monroe, and he lied to me about his last name, I mean his address and where he's from. Random guy pulls up behind me and said, hey, this guy's looking for that kid. I need to know if this car has been reported missing, stolen. He, and I know he's BSing to me about where he's going. He says he's going to his sister's house down here. If you could, hey, talk to him, see if you can figure out if the sister thing is legit. He said this guy gave him the car. He's got the GPS on his phone on the, on the back lid. He said that's where he's going. And I knew he was lying then. 
Slowly, things are starting to become more clear. If Mitchell is telling the truth, it seems as though his brother is letting him drive a car that he stole from the original owner. But that still doesn't explain the bullet holes, why Mitchell lied about his address, or why the random man appeared looking for him knowing he was driving that vehicle. But now on top of all of that, the cop has also just been told over the radio that there's a missing person report hidden amongst this mess. What I'm being told is that the boy who gave him permission to use the car is missing. So he's lying his ass off. I go looking for the person who owns the car, find out that the, the son of the owner of the car is missing. And now we got bullet holes all in the car. I got you. So something's... The only thing he lied about was his address and went for If he if he's knows something about this boy that's missing the bullet holes, I'd like to at least, I guess I'll do as much good contact as I can. A few more calls are made, and it turns out the missing person is Michael Robinson, the alleged brother of the boy at the scene, and the man who gave him permission to be driving the car today. However, it's still unclear who owned the car in the first place, but the cop decides to forget about that for a moment and examine the vehicle a second time now that backup has arrived. Like, this looks close. Like, like bam, 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 bam. Yeah. In the boat. <laughs> See? See? Little did he know, this is where all his questions would be answered at once, in the most gruesome way imaginable. I'm gonna do the obvious thing I want to do. Hey. Yep. Put your hands up. Put your hands behind, behind your back. Put your hands behind your back. You have a right to an attorney. Have one present during any questioning. At any time you choose not to make any statements or answer any questions. You understand? If you cannot afford an, an attorney, one will be appointed to represent you by the court. Do you understand? Inside the trunk was the body of Michael Robinson. And all of a sudden, everything makes sense. 26 is 125-030-57. 125 F-39 Troop F desk. Good. Um, need a supervisor out here. All right, I get the guy out. He's super nervous. Uh, he lies to me about his address. He's got no driver's license. He says he's going to his house in Winsboro. Well, I find out he lives in Richwood. I pop the trunk. Sorry, there's a dead body in the trunk. Okay, so I, I'm not. We're, we've blocked. We've blocked in front of the car and behind the car. We've shut the trunk. We've shut the trunk. I have Franklin Parish Sheriff's Office with me. Uh, we're at 82. Okay, we're not. We're we're done. It turns out Michael Robinson wasn't related to Mitchell at all. Instead, he was merely an unintentional casualty of an armed robbery Mitchell was part of earlier. Who is that? Who is that? That's him. Who is who? That's Mike. That's Mike. Yeah. How did Mike get there? Tell me. It wasn't me, man. It was. Okay. I just hit him. I just hit him. Bro, I did. You just hit him? I did. In the mayhem of the robbery, Mitchell shot Robinson multiple times with a handgun before loading him into his trunk and driving him away to Winsboro to dump the body. But of course, before he could make it, he was pulled over by the officer for speeding. Michael Mitchell is being charged for the armed robbery and the second degree murder of Michael Robinson. Mitchell is currently awaiting his trial, but is expected to be sentenced to life behind bars.